Good morning, everybody. Nice to see you all. A uh, couple quick things before we get started, just a logistical announcement. I know that the call time for the President's event with the Pittsburgh Penguins is in about 45 or 50 minutes here. So uh, if you need to excuse yourself to uh, participate in that event, uh, I will not be personally offended. Second, um, the President was updated once again on the uh, preparations underway to prepare for the likely landfall of Hurricane Matthew. The weather forecasters uh, at the National Hurricane Center and at NOAA uh, now anticipate that the impact of the storm in the United States is likely to be quite significant. Uh, we strongly encourage people who live in the areas that are likely to be affected to heed the warnings and instructions of local officials, including evacuation orders. The instructions that are being offered by local officials are informed by information that they are receiving from scientists and from federal officials. And those instructions are geared toward protecting people. And we believe that it's important for people to listen to those instructions. We also encourage people to stay up to date on the weather forecast. Those of you who have been covering this story know that the weather forecast or the forecast track of the storm has changed multiple times just this week. Uh, so it certainly is not outside the realm of possibility that could change once again. Uh, we want to encourage uh, people to stay up to date on that. But what we did learn overnight is that it's uh, likely that the storm could strengthen further before uh, making landfall. And that obviously is uh, deeply concerning. Uh, so we want people to be prepared. Uh, the last thing I'd say about this is if there are those who doubt the intensity or severity of the storm, they need only look at the images uh, that are uh, coming back from Haiti. Uh, that's clear the storm had a rather significant impact in Haiti. Uh, and that is pretty good evidence of um, you know, what people in the southeast could be facing. Um, for those Americans that are interested in uh, offering up their assistance to Haiti. We encourage people to visit CIDI.org. Uh, it's a place where you can get some more information uh, about how uh, you can help a country like Haiti that doesn't have the resources that we do uh, to deal with uh, such a significant storm. Um, but, you know, obviously this is a pivotal day. Uh, people need to be uh, making preparations and following orders uh, today. The storm is likely uh, to begin being felt uh, this evening. And uh, you know, certainly over the course of the day, those of us who don't live in uh, potentially affected areas uh, will be sending our prayers uh, to those who are uh, potentially in harm's way. Uh, but um, people could, should take confidence uh, from knowing that federal officials have been working very effectively with officials at the state and local level to prepare in advance of this storm. Uh, we've developed uh, an expertise, uh, and we intend to use our resources and that expertise to protect the American people, uh, and um, that will be put, be put to the test in the next few days. So uh, with that, uh, Darlene, do you want to get us started? Yes. Um, a couple of uh, follow-up questions on the latest theft of classified information. Um, does the administration have a better sense of exactly what information was taken or stolen? This is um, an investigation that is being led at the FBI. Um, federal prosecutors obviously uh, released documents yesterday uh, that indicated that this individual had been in custody for several weeks. Um, the Department of Justice also made clear in the documents that were released yesterday that the investigation is ongoing. Um, so uh, as there is more information that our investigators are comfortable discussing publicly, uh, they'll make the decision uh, to do so. Uh, and, you know, obviously, uh, you know, protecting sensitive national security information is a top priority of the administration, and it certainly is uh, an issue that this administration takes seriously. It's also an issue that uh, prosecutors and investigators at the Department of Justice take seriously. Um, so that investigation is continuing, and uh, as additional inf information can be made public about it, it will come from the Department of Justice. People everywhere are probably wondering how this could happen again after Edward Snowden. Um, 
plan reforms that were supposed to have been put in place after this notice left. Can you address at all how something like this has happened again in the post Snowden era? Well, uh, Darlene, I, I, I'm going to hesitate to draw um, uh, too many connections between these two cases. Each case is uh, unique. Uh, some of the similarities in the cases have been well documented publicly. Um, but let me start by answering your question about the reforms that have been put in place. Uh, the administration has put in place um, uh, reforms principally through the National Insider Threat Task Force that is being led by the Office of, Director of, of the Director of National Intelligence. Uh, we have established government-wide minimum reforms for these kinds of insider threat programs that prevent uh, the theft uh, or unauthorized disclosure of sensitive information. The intelligence community has launched a series of continuous evaluation programs uh, to help determine whether an individual with a security clearance uh, needs it and should continue to hold it. Uh, that effort has been effective in actually reducing the overall number of people that hold security clearances. That number has fallen about 17 percent in just the last several years. Um, there also has been a requirement instituted that individuals who hold a security clearance need to uh, submit to a reinvestigation every five years to ensure that they are complying with the, uh, with the terms that they have <coughs> committed to. What we've also tried to do is to enhance the quality of background check and uh, investigations, background investigations. And there is a new agency that's been stood up uh, to ensure that those investigations are more thorough and more efficiently conducted. Uh, so this is certainly something that uh, the administration takes seriously. And there are important lessons that we have learned since the case of Mr. Snowden, but uh, Darlene, I think that this, this risk is always going to be there as long as there is a desire to share sensitive information across the government. And we know that there is a risk of not sharing that information. You recall that this is one of the principal insights of the 9-11 Commission, that there is too much stovepiping inside of the federal government. There were particular pieces of information that had they been shared across the government could have been effectively used to keep the American people safe. So the sharing of this information is critical. It's just critical that we, that individuals who are entrusted with this information keep the commitment that they've made to the American people to protect it. Let me close by saying that um, these are the kinds of risks that our government has faced since the, uh, well, at least for a very long time. Uh, and. You know, we were talking a little bit earlier today about, you know, again, an entirely different case, uh, you know, but a situation about 15 years ago where there was an individual who uh, was arrested by U.S. officials because he was accused of stealing, sen stealing sensitive information and passing it on to the Russians. This is the Hansen case. Uh, so you know, the case of Mr. Snowden uh, and this individual uh, is unique. Uh, each is unique. Uh, you know, uh, obviously, the Snowden case uh, got some extra attention because Frankly, he was so publicly on the lam. Um, but this is something that, the, that our government has been confronting for a long time, and it's something that in some ways is even more complicated, uh, given the modern communications tools that we have access to now, that make it easier to pass this information uh, along. Again, there's a benefit to that in terms of enhancing information sharing, uh, but there's a risk, and that's a risk that we're working very diligently to mitigate. Does the administration see this latest case as serious as the Snowden case, or is it too early to um, make that comparison? Yeah, I, I think um, it's certainly too early for me to draw that kind of connection or to offer up that kind of an assessment. But our investigators at the uh, at the at the Department of Justice are conducting their own independent investigation, and they will do so uh, with uh, a sense of urgency because they recognize how significant uh, the stakes are in cases like this. Um, but I'll let them speak to what they've learned and um, you know, offer an assessment if they're prepared to do so about just how serious it is. Okay. Roberta. Does the President intend to do anything to try to prevent Aleppo from falling? Well, Roberta, the United States has been deeply engaged um, in the international diplomacy to reduce the violence in Syria. We've obviously been uh, in, involved in that effort for a number of years now. 
the United States uh, just yesterday participated in an ISSG meeting. This is the International Serious Support Group that was convened. Uh, uh, this is a group of uh, uh, a couple dozen countries who are concerned about the situation in Syria and have assessed that they have a significant national interest in resolving the situation inside of Syria. And the United States has worked effectively in a leadership role in that group to try to uh, bring the international community together around some potential solutions. Uh, I can tell you that U.S. officials, uh, I believe, are meeting today with our European allies uh, in Europe uh, to discuss uh, the situation inside of Syria. This is the so-called Quint meeting uh, that uh, is held at a variety of levels. Uh, but the, the focus of those discussions today uh, was on the situation in Syria. Uh, the United States is obviously very focused on supporting UN-led efforts, and there are a variety of those. There's obviously the efforts that are underway by uh, the UN Special Envoy, Mr. De Mistura, to try to reduce the violence inside of Syria. And um, there's also been extensive work that's been done at the United Nations Security Council over the years uh, to try to uh, focus the international community on potential solutions inside of Syria and on Aleppo in particular. We continue to be deeply concerned about the tactics used by the Assad regime and the Russians that are focused on harming civilians. And that's, uh, it's deeply troubling what's happening there. And um, you know, the United States has been deeply engaged through diplomacy uh, around the world uh, to try to address it. But I guess uh, very specifically on the immediate threat that faces Aleppo, is the United States, is the President, considering and doing anything to try to prevent it from falling, from falling beyond diplomacy and sort of the broader effort? Well, uh, again, Roberta, our, our conclusion about the root cause of the chaos inside of Syria is that there is no military solution uh, to the many problems that are plaguing Syria. And we are working urgently to end the violence in Syria and in Aleppo through diplomatic channels. We have been very focused on that through the and through all the channels that I just described. There is an important role for the United States military to play in terms of leading a counter-ISIL coalition, uh, and those military efforts have moved aggressively uh, to roll back territory that ISIL previously controlled and to apply significant pressure to the leadership of ISIL and other extremist organizations that are operating inside of Syria. In fact, the Department of Defense announced earlier this week that uh, a senior al-Qaeda leader in Syria uh, was uh, the target of a uh, military strike. Uh, that's an indication of the vigilance that is being exercised by the United States military as they try to keep the American people safe. So our military is deeply engaged in the counter-ISIL campaign, uh, but we're also trying to address the root cause of all this chaos, which is the uh, political situation inside of Syria, and we're working diligently through diplomatic channels to try to reduce the violence and increase the flow of humanitarian assistance. Just briefly, um, 44 Afghan troops um, who are in the United States for military training have gone missing over the past two years, uh, presumably to, to live and perhaps work illegally in the United States. Um, I guess I'm wondering how concerned is the White House about um, the questions that this will raise about training and, and security, given that I mean they were they were training with the, the DOD and, and they sort of gone AWOL. Well, uh, Roberta, I can't speak to any individual cases, uh, but I would refer you to my colleagues at the Department of Defense who may have more information on this for you. Okay. Michelle. I just want to read to you something that just came in this morning um, from FBI sources. I just lost it, so give me one second. Okay. Here it is. Okay, so the FBI believes Harold T. Martin III has been illegally taking home classified information for years. When they raided his property, they found thousands of pages of classified documents, hundreds of thumb drives, hard drives, dozens of computers and servers. He appeared to have his own server farm, enough to operate his own cloud. So I think it's one thing if, you know, he started doing this last week and they suddenly caught him. I, I mean, I know he's been in custody for two weeks, but mm -hmm. if this was a recent thing. But, but the fact that he, the FBI believes he's been illegally taking home classified information for years. And you listed a number of changes that were made after the Snowden case. So how do you have any confidence that all the changes that were made are really doing anything if this person was able to do this It's believed, for that amount of time? Well, Michelle, I'm not going to be able to discuss uh, any additional details about what the uh, FBI or investigators have been able to find. 
Uh, so I'll leave it to them to disclose exactly what the what those investigations have uncovered so far. Those investigations are obviously ongoing. The the kind of steps that we have taken to mitigate against so-called insider threats uh, are significant, and uh, they have um, made some progress in terms of, of uh, accomplishing some of our goals, improving the background check system, reducing the number of people that have security clearances, making some technical changes to the kind of access that people are given to sensitive information. Um, you know, there are a variety of both intuitive and highly technical steps that we can take to try to limit this, uh, this risk. But this is a risk that is always going to exist. Uh, that risk is more significant, you know, given the kinds of uh, technology that's available now uh, that allows for the uh, efficient transfer of information. Again, that is largely a good thing in terms of making the U.S. government more effective, integrating our defenses in a way that can have a positive impact on our national security, but it does include an inherent risk, and this is a risk that predates this kind of technology. I think what is unquestionably true is that the vast majority of uh, the men and women in our intelligence community take very seriously the responsibility that they have to the American people to treat sensitive information protectively. They understand the consequences that protecting that information has for our national security. They understand that the effective use of that information enhances our national security. These are individuals who, in some cases, have the kind of expertise that would allow them to collect a much larger paycheck in the private sector, but instead they use that expertise to protect the American people in a government job. And uh, uh, you know, that's a, a, a pretty clear indication of their patriotism. Yeah. Uh, but look, for these individual cases, this is a, this is a risk that exists. And as the investigation moves forward, uh, if there is more that we can learn about additional protections that we should put in place to prevent uh, something like this from happening again, we certainly will uh, you know, learn from this situation. And if there are uh, additional reforms that are worth implementing, then we won't hesitate to do so because the President has made this a genuine priority. There just seems to be in such a secure operation, such a gaping hole, <coughs> that this person had the ability to take home classified information over the course of years, w wouldn't you agree that I mean, there, there's obviously a need for some, some different kind of changes than, than the ones that were already made? Well, there have been important changes that have made, and we've already seen some important positive results uh, from them. But we, we certainly will, as more is learned about this case, as the investigation continues, uh, you know, part of this investigation will be understanding exactly uh, how this person was able to uh, evade detection and uh, commit the the crimes that are alleged, uh, then um, you know we'll want to learn from that and uh, implement the kinds of reforms or solutions that would prevent others uh, from doing the same thing. Okay, and the latest voice that we've heard this week um, was from the UN's uh, human rights chief, um, calling, as others have, for limit of the use of the veto in the Security Council. Does the U.S. support that, and and does the administration think that that would actually do any good, especially at this point? Um, to try to make changes in what's happening in Syria? Well, there certainly has been. Uh, the United States has been disappointed at the way in which Russia, and to a certain extent China, have wielded their veto authority on the UN Security Council to blunt international efforts to limit the violence inside of Syria. We've been disappointed that they have used that veto to protect Assad. There have also been movements at the United Nations Security Council to uh, raise concerns uh, about the conduct of individuals in that conflict and to ensure that they are met with some accountability. Those accountability measures have been blocked by the Russians. So we've been deeply concerned by the way that Russia has used its veto power on the UN Security Council to prevent as much action from the UN as we would like to see. I know there has been a broader uh, and in some ways more esoteric discussion about uh, proposed reforms of the UN Security Council and the way that it works. I know that there have been some proposals to enlarge it. Uh, you know, our 
Uh, friends in India are certainly interested in benefiting from reforms like that. Um, but uh, you know, as it relates to the situation inside of Syria, I think you know our concern, uh, our most urgent concern, is with the way that Russia has used their veto authority uh, uh, on the Security Council uh, at the United Nations. So is that something that that should be done and should be? looked at more closely now, or, or is, do you feel like now is not the time for that, that it's not really going to do anything at this point? Well, I think you know, many United Nations processes are characterized by the length um, of time it takes to complete them, uh, and surely the idea of reforming those processes is um, also likely to take a long time, too. So uh, you know, we've expressed in other contexts our support for uh, a set of reforms that could make the United Nations more efficient, more effective, and potentially even more representative. Uh, but you know, our focus right now is on um, you know, trying to reduce uh, the violence in an urgent situation inside of Syria. Okay, Justin. Um, I would guess I wanted to follow on a couple things Michelle asked about. Um, first, the reason that the veto conversation is particularly relevant is reports that the U.S. is considering. Um, sanctions against com companies in response to uh, chemical weapons use in, in Syria. Um, I know that you never sort of talk about sanctions before they happen, but it, would the U.S. be willing to pursue sanctions with Europe, Europe and other allies outside the framework of the U.N. to address concerns in, in Syria? Well, there are other uh, examples of the United States being able to work effectively outside of the auspices of the UN to implement sanctions in a coordinated fashion to maximize the impact uh, of those sanctions. So the situation in Ukraine is obviously the best example where the United States has been able to work uh, uh, effectively with our European allies to impose uh, tough sanctions against Russia. Uh, of course, I would be among the first to point out that the uh, sanctions that we have imposed on Russia in concert with our European allies mm -hmm. as a result of Russia's actions in Ukraine have not yet achieved the desired result. We haven't seen the change in strategy on the part of the Russians that we'd like to see in Ukraine. We haven't seen them indicate their clear respect for the uh, territorial integrity and sovereignty uh, of Ukraine. Um, but. We do know that those sanctions have had an impact on Russia's economy. Russia is paying the price for their actions inside of Ukraine, and that price is one that they have to pay because of the ability of the United States to work effectively with our European partners to impose those costs. That's something that we didn't, through the, didn't do through the UN, obviously, because uh, Russia uh, has a veto uh, on the UN Security Council. So that's, that's one example of where we have been willing to work outside the auspices of the, of the United Nations, but in, and in a way that has had uh, an impact, even if we have not yet achieved the desired result. So what I would say is our preference is always to work through the UN um, when it comes to implementing these sanctions, because it means that even more countries uh, are able to uh, coordinate their actions with the United States, uh, which essentially has a multiplier effect in terms of the strength of the sanctions and the size of the cost. Um, but outside of, we do have options and we have demonstrated uh, an ability to work outside of the UN to achieve a similar result. I so I guess, I guess the point is, in this case, I wouldn't rule out um, multilateral efforts outside of the UN uh, to uh, impose costs uh, on Syria or Russia or others uh, with regard to the situation inside of Syria. Uh, we've done that in the past, and I wouldn't take that off the table in terms of the options that the President may consider in this situation. On the data theft, um, I know you spoke to Michelle yesterday, um, and then again this morning at some length about steps that you've taken, um, particularly related to federal contractors, but in both this and the Snowden case, um, these were contractors that work, were working for Booz Allen Hamilton mm -hmm. in, in particular, and so I'm wondering if this has inspired any sort of reevaluation on whether that firm should be involved in or receive U.S. government contracts on, on highly classified data to their employees engaging in kind of 
huge that. Right. Yeah. Uh, I'm not aware that uh, the, in, the investigation that's been conducted thus far has detected any wrongdoing on the part of the company. Um, you know, so I'll, I'd refer questions about that to the uh, Department of Justice. My guess is that uh, since they're still in the midst of the, of the uh, investigation, they're not likely to uh, talk about that a whole lot. Um, but look, we want to learn as much as we can about this situation. And as I indicated to Michelle, um, you know, if there are lessons that we can learn, and reforms that can be implemented to prevent something like this from happening again. We certainly want to do that. But as long as we are sharing information with government employees, sensitive national security information that is critical to protecting the country, this kind of risk exists. Uh, but the risk of not sharing that information uh, is even higher. And that, that's one of the lessons we learned after 9-11. The GAO re released a report yesterday that found that the Obama administration spends about a billion dollars on PR annually, and that you guys have added um, 667 PR staffers during this administration, and that their median salary was $90,000. Um, this has raised some criticism um, from, from government groups and from critics on the right. So I'm wondering if you could maybe talk about why it's important for the administration to have added all those staffers and be spending that amount of money on, on PR. I, I haven't seen the report, um, so it's hard for me to uh, uh, assess the, uh, the conclusions that they've reached. What I can just say in general is that the administration has made it a priority to uh, interact with the public and interact with the press corps and to be as transparent as possible. And um, that, is, uh, that is work that requires dedicated professionals who are interested in furthering that goal and helping the American people understand exactly uh, what the administration is doing, uh, what we have prioritized, and uh, what our success has been in implementing uh, the agenda laid out by President Obama. So, um, you know, I think our track record on this is uh, pretty strong, both in terms of the substantive progress that we've made, but also in terms of the effective way in which we've been able to communicate with the American public. I think the, the American public and our democracy is well served by that. Uh, but. Um, you know, it, there's not much that we do around here that isn't the source of uh, vociferous criticism from those on the right. So um, they're certainly entitled to do that. Okay. Rob. Uh, the storm and uh, FEMA, do you have any more specifics about the size and scope or metrics of the federal response so far? I know that there have been teams and resources um, <coughs> prepositioned. Are we talking about hundreds of people or dozens of people or, or, or just what? Yeah. Well, uh, Ron, I don't have a whole lot of new metrics to share with you. Uh, I can uh, certainly contact my colleagues at FEMA. Uh, I don't know if those are some of the people that were added to the, uh, uh, to the, uh, to the GAO report or not. But um, uh, yeah, exactly. Uh, those are the people who would find out that information for you. Let me see what we can do on that. Look, but there is, I can provide you a little texture here, which is that there has been um, there have been a number of resources that have been pre-deployed to the region. Uh, this is a uh, a relatively new strategy that's been implemented uh, under the leadership of uh, Administrator Fugate. Uh, the idea here is to essentially pre-stage supplies that are likely to be needed in areas that are just outside of the um, uh, affected areas so that after the storm passes, uh, this, these resources are all in one place uh, and not too far away from where they're needed most. Uh, so that, that work has been going on for several days now, and we can provide you some additional information about the quantity of those supplies. Uh, the other thing that I can tell you is that there are a number of uh, coordination centers that have been set up all set up uh, up and down the East Coast. Uh, and those coordination centers are now operating uh, around the clock, uh, and they're fully staffed. Uh, and that requires a lot of people uh, to uh, ensure that those operations can continue uh, around the clock. The other thing that we have prioritized, Ron, and this is something that the President uh, raised in his discussion with uh, federal officials yesterday uh, is his concern about potential power outages. Uh, you know, anytime you're dealing with a storm like this, you want to try and get the power back up as soon as possible. That's certainly true in this case. Uh, so some of the supplies that are being mobilized are fuel for generators, for example, so that people who have emergency generators uh, can um, get them up and running, uh, but also so that critical facilities like hospitals uh, can also fuel their, their generators. Uh, there also has been a lot of important work done to uh, pool the resources of utilities uh, in regions of the country that are not affected by the storm 
so that they can uh, share their personnel and their trucks and their equipment uh, to help those communities that are experiencing some widespread devastation. And uh, some of that coordination work has uh, been done in advance as well, because this is a, obviously a, a priority that we're mindful of. Power is going to go out, and people are going to be challenged to operate in an environment where the power is, uh, uh, is not on. We just want to try to do as much planning as we can in advance so that we can get it on as quickly as possible. Have there been any uh, disaster declarations yet or requests? I believe the governor of Florida made a request. Uh, he made a request for an emergency declaration, which is essentially uh, a request that can be submitted to the federal government in advance uh, of a storm. This is a relatively new innovation as well, again, to expedite the provision of federal support in a situation like this. Uh, there is a process uh, that FEMA uh, considers when uh, when they receive an application like this, I know that they'll work quickly to uh, evaluate it and respond. Um, but but uh, responded. I'm not aware that they have yet, but they are. Um, they will. Uh, they will respond quickly. Is that a presidential response? I believe it. Uh, it's what it is is it is something that is um, moved that, that goes through FEMA first. The 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 application is considered and processed there. Uh, I do believe there is a step that requires presidential sign off, but. Uh, that, uh, that is not a process that takes uh, very long. The president relies heavily on the advice he receives from experts at FEMA. Is there any consideration of the president um, altering his travel plans? Uh, at this point, there's no, pl no plans uh, uh, on the part of the president to change his travel. He obviously is traveling to a part of the country that is um, not in the path of the storm. Uh, but even as the president travels, he will stay closely attuned to uh, federal officials who are on the front lines of supporting the uh, state and local officials who are leading the response. That's the proper role for the federal government in these situations. It's that the federal government plays a supporting role in terms of providing supplies and offering advice. But ultimately, it's the responsibility of state and local officials to uh, manage the response. That's why we're encouraging people right now to listen, listen to the instructions of state and local officials. They know best about what's needed to protect their communities. They are also going to know what's best uh, about what's needed to help their communities recover. Uh, and the role of the federal government is to to support them as they do that important work. Just on, on Aleppo, um, is, is there a national security meeting? Is the president having any meetings today on that on that situation? Uh, I'm not aware of any um, uh, formal presidential meetings like this. The president obviously has a, uh, has a PDB this morning, um, but uh, you know the president meets regularly with his national security team. I I don't have any details to share with you about any meetings today. There was a statement from the Syrian army last night warning civilians to get out. Is is it is it the um, is the administration, the administration's assessment that Aleppo is about to fall, is that conceivable in the way you see the situation there on the ground now? And is there a response that you have planned should that happen? Well, first of all, I think it's outrageous that the a military organization that has been attacking civilians for years, using barrel bombs, weaponized, um, chemicals, uh, industrial chemicals like chlorine, um, bunker-busting bombs. For them to suggest that somehow they're now looking out for the interests of civilians is outrageous. Uh, so what I'll say in general is I think it's an indication of why the world is so concerned about the situation in Aleppo right now. Uh, I don't have an assessment to offer in terms of the latest conditions on the ground, but uh, that is a city that's been under siege for years. Uh, and that the pace of that siege and the intensity of that siege has uh, only increased in the last couple of weeks. Uh, that's been deeply distressing, um, but I, I don't have assessment to share in terms of uh, how or, uh, you know, or how likely it is that that city will fall. And, and there's nothing that you could say that might be more reassuring to the world community who's very concerned about this, about any contingency plans or any other I mean, we hear your statements about the horrific nature of all this all the time. A lot of people are looking for some, some sort of action, frankly, something tangible. Yeah. Well, again, Ron, I think the kind of action that I've been talking about is the conversations that we've been having through the auspices of the United Nations, trying to support the work of the UN envoy there, uh, the conversation we've been having with our European allies about the situation uh, in Aleppo. There are a number of bilateral conversations that the United States has been engaged in with uh, uh, our partners and friends in the region. Uh, so we've been very focused on this, and you know our goal has been to try to reduce the violence in Aleppo and, and expedite the provision of humanitarian assistance. The United States has now provided about $5.9 billion in humanitarian assistance, more than any other country in the world. 
Uh, so you know, the United States has been engaged uh, in trying to address the, the problems in Aleppo, and um, uh, many other people around the world have been as well. Despite that, it's fair to say the situation just keeps getting worse. Well, we've been deeply concerned about the increasing pace of attacks from the Syrian army and uh, with the support of the uh, Russian military. Uh, that's, that's been deeply distressing. So, so do you it's your position that the, the U.S. response has been adequate, appropriate? Uh, Ron, I don't think there's anybody satisfying when you see, satisfied when you see such widespread death and destruction. Uh, the, the blood that has been shed by innocent civilians, men, women, and children, has been deeply distressing. And um, I don't think there's anybody that feels good about the situation in Aleppo right now. Okay. Rich. Just, just to uh, get inside some of the conversations that he's having with FEMA and um, with others in the administration dealing with the storm, um, is the administration's viewpoint that, that there is the there is the chance that this could be the most significant damaging weather event in, in the administration uh, that the administration has had to deal with, uh, and the potential that these local officials, who are the ones who are uh, responsible for handling the immediate response will turn to the federal government if there are large groups of people displaced uh, and, and a great need for resources. Well, you know, Rich, what the scientists tell us is that this is likely the largest and most powerful hurricane to hit the United States in a, in a decade or so. And uh, the preparations that ha we have been making in advance of the storm, I think, are indicative of just how serious we think it is. Uh, that's why you've seen such a forceful response mobilized by the federal government, even in advance of the storm, making landfall. We've seen a similar response from state and local officials, and that's a positive thing as well. Uh, but this is something that this is a storm that people should take seriously. Uh, the federal government is taking it seriously, and it's important for people who live in uh, in the path of the storm uh, to take it quite seriously as well. Have there been any conversations yet? Might be getting a little ahead, but um, if there's a need for an additional appropriation with Congress out. Um, have there been those discussions with congressional leaders at all? I'm not aware of those discussions at this point. What we typically will do is do a damage assessment to determine just how uh, significant the losses are. Uh, and th from there, we can uh, make a determination about uh, whether or not it is necessary for Congress to consider an additional appropriation. Uh, turning to the President's piece on the economy and The Economist, um, he talks about expressions of um, of uh, Americans now are echoes of the past. He talks about know nothingism, um, which I assume is is uh, is a shot, perhaps more at those who support Donald Trump. But he does talk about how, uh, as appealing to some more radical reforms, can sound in the abstract. Breaking up all the biggest banks or erecting prohibitively steep tariffs on imports uh, on the economy is not an abstraction. Uh, in writing this, does the president see that sentiment uh, equally spread uh, among Democrats and Republicans? I think the president addresses this directly in the uh, uh, in the piece, which is that this sentiment uh, is more widespread on the right than it is on the left. Uh, but it is a phenomenon on uh, on the extremes uh, of both ends of the ideological spectrum. And uh, I think the president makes a pretty persuasive, uh, if detailed, case for the kinds of things that we can do to address uh, the concerns that have been raised. I think the president's view is that the concerns that have been raised are legitimate. Uh, some of the proposed responses that we've seen from the extremes on both ends uh, are not, and in some cases would end up doing more damage, would compound the negative impacts uh, of globalization that are being experienced by some communities. And uh, there actually are some things we can do to try to compound the positive impacts uh, of the forces of globalization. Let me just give you one example. The, the, the article itself is quite long, and I commend it to everybody's attention. I won't repeat all of the case that the president makes, but you know, one example of this would be um, investments in education. We know in an increasingly integrated global economy, those who have marketable, highly technical skills are in a position to succeed as a result of the global economy. We know that jobs that are tied to the international economy, that are tied to exports <coughs> here in the United States, pay substantially more than the average job that's not tied to exports. So why wouldn't we make the kinds of investments that would ensure that our workforce can benefit from that kind of opportunity? So let's make sure that we're investing in early childhood education. Let's make sure we open up the doors to a college education to every middle class family and every family that's working hard to get into the middle class. Let's do more to give individuals who are ready to make a mid-career shift get the kind of job training that they need to qualify for these higher paying 
uh, higher paying jobs. That's the kind of common sense approach that the president advocates. There are others who say that we should respond to this situation by trying to close the U.S. economy off from the global supply chain. Uh, that would have a terrible impact on our broader economy, but it also would reduce the number of jobs that are tied to expor exports, which means that that's, uh, there's a smaller number of higher paying jobs to be, uh, to be gained. So it's important that we focus on specific, rather common sense strategies for compounding the positive benefits uh, to some of these global changes in the economy as opposed to making the, the negative consequences even worse. The President also talks about um, many of the positive points of the economy. We're not at a point where we're losing 700,000 jobs monthly, um, income gains. Uh, but there still are issues out there, GDP growth between 1 and 2 percent, a federal funds rate that the Fed views as an economy that isn't strong enough to support uh, a target rate of higher than a quarter to a half percent. Um, is an issue here also that just that growth just broad-based isn't strong enough yet? Well, we know that one of the headwinds that we face from uh, for growth here in the United States is actually from the weakened international economy. The United States benefits from uh, being able to trade with the world. And when our trading partners uh, have uh, economies that aren't performing at particularly high levels, that's going to have an impact on the number of goods and services they purchase from the United States. So that certainly is part of it, and that's why you know, much of the audience for uh, this piece is, um, is the international community, international policymakers, international business leaders uh, who can have an impact on some of these uh, broader trends. Uh, I think what's, uh, what's also true, Rich, is that the, uh, we've encountered uh, opposition from those on the extreme right who wield inordinate influence in the United States Congress. They have succeeded in blocking the kind of common sense investments in infrastructure and education that would have a material positive impact on economic growth. Economic growth would be higher if Republicans hadn't blocked policies that contribute to economic growth. So I know that, that um, at the risk of offending my, my, my friends with uh, years of uh, technical education in the field of economics, this isn't that complicated. And it's the opposition to common sense proposals like investments in education, investments in infrastructure, that have prevented uh, the U.S. economy from performing even better uh, than we have thus far. And um, again, I guess that's where the uh, allusion to the know-nothings might come in. All right, Jordan. Thanks, Josh. Uh, on the first thing, the Obama administration and Governor Scott have sparred in the past over disaster relief and emergency funding. I believe that Governor Scott has the uh, far higher rejection rate for emergency funding requests, FEMA, than other states and governors around the country. So given that, can you describe the administration's interaction with Governor Scott's administration thus far on this storm and describe how, how those interactions have been? Well, Jordan, when we're talking about millions of Americans who are in the path of a potentially devastating storm, the likes of which we haven't seen in the United States in about a decade or so, we put partisan politics aside and we focus on making sure that we're meeting the basic needs of uh, our fellow Americans. So uh, there's been extensive coordination uh, between uh, federal officials and uh, state emergency officials in Florida. Um, those of you who follow these issues closely know that uh, Craig Fugate is a Floridian himself. And he burnished his reputation as an expert in emergency management in helping the state of Florida uh, in 2004 and 2005 uh, deal with an unprecedented series of hurricanes that struck his state. Uh, you know, my personal experience with this is in, uh, uh, in 2006, uh, 10 years ago now, I was uh, uh, working on the Florida governor's race uh, for the Democratic candidate for governor. And one of the principal talking points of the both Democratic and Republican candidate for governor was to promise to leave Craig Fugate in his job. Uh, so I think that's a pretty clear indication that uh, Mr. Fugate uh, doesn't consider politics when doing his job. I'm sure that contributes to the su success that he has enjoyed in terms of providing service to the American people. Uh, but that's also been the approach that President Obama has taken as well. Uh, and we would expect uh, that the significant di political differences that exist between 
uh, Governor Scott and the White House are going to have zero impact on the uh, ability of emergency officials in Florida to get the kind of help and support and assistance they need from federal officials when dealing with this storm. Okay. Karen. Josh, can you give us an update on what the U.S. is doing in Haiti? I mean, the pictures coming in are showing just massive destruction. There's a lot of areas that are completely cut off right now. I think earlier in the week there was talk about helicopters going down and getting supplies to the capital, but is there an update you can give on resources that have been sent or are going to be sent there? I know that my colleagues at the, uh, at the Department of Defense can talk to you about some of the resources that have been mobilized, uh, military resources have been mobilized to assist in recovery efforts in Haiti. Uh, I don't have those statistics in front of me, but we can certainly get you some more information about that. There's also been some important work done through USAID um, to, uh, to deal with the impact of the storm. Uh, USAID foreign disaster assistance teams were actually deployed to both Haiti and Jamaica and the Bahamas in advance of the storm hitting. So there are already disaster recovery experts from the United States on the ground in these places uh, to assist these uh, local governments in um, setting up uh, a recovery effort. Um, there has been an initial uh, contribution from USAID um, of $1.5 million to uh, address some of the humani immediate humanitarian needs. Uh, after, in the aftermath of the hurricane, uh, but that's just an initial payment, and I'm sure that there will be additional resources that will come from the U.S. government to assist uh, our friends in Haiti who are dealing with a very difficult situation. But uh, you know, I just want to mention once again, there's an opportunity for uh, uh, Americans uh, who might be concerned about the situation there. They can go to CIDI.org. Uh, this is a, a nonprofit organization that's dedicated to disseminating, disseminating information uh, in the aftermath of disasters, and they also uh, can ensure that um, financial resources that are dedicated to the recovery effort get to the right place and are used effectively. Um, we talked a lot, you've had a lot of statements this week about the U.S. Russia relationship, the plutonium deal, the diplomatic talks over Syria. Uh, this morning, there's a seemingly extraordinary statement from a spokesman for the Russian defense minister strongly warning the U.S. to not make any attempts to conduct military strikes against Assad regime targets in Syria. Uh, being taken as threatening to shoot down American planes if the U.S. tries to do that. Uh, what's the right White House response? Well, I haven't seen that statement. What I, what I will say is uh, there, um, there was a concerted effort on the part of the United States to try to work effectively with the Russians to reduce violence inside of Syria. And time and time again, the Russians did not live up to the commitments that they had made in the context of those negotiations. And that was a source of deep disappointment, not just here in the United States, but around the world. And it's had tragic consequences for innocent civilians uh, in and around Aleppo. At the same time, there's no interest on the part of the United States in escalating the violence uh, in Syria. We actually want to see the violence and the conflict reduced. Uh, and that's what we're working so diligently through diplomatic channels to try to affect. Gardner. Josh, <clears throat> this administration has prosecuted more leaked cases than all previous presidents combined. And this administration has suffered three of the largest thefts of classified information in American history. This one, the WikiLeaks one, and the Snowden one. Has the administration's crackdown been a failure? Well, uh, Gardner, we can walk through the uh, the the statistics about the uh, leak prosecutions, I think what is clear is that the administration does take quite seriously the need to protect sensitive national security information. Of course, those decisions about how and whether to prosecute an individual uh, are made by officials at the Department of Justice. Uh, those decisions are made without any sort of political influence. Uh, of course, there is general policy direction that does come from the White House about the priority placed on protecting national security and protecting sensitive information, but those prosecutorial decisions are made by independent prosecutors at the, at the Department of Justice. Uh, more generally, I think that what we have seen, Gardner, is the impact that modern technology has on the movement and dissemination of information.
there's an upside. That technology can be used to ensure that national security information can be quickly, instantaneously shared across the federal government in a way that keeps our men and women in uniform safe, in a way that aids terrorism investigations being conducted by the United States and our allies around the world, and in a way that protects the United States homeland. The downside risk of this technology is that those with bad intentions can, on an unprecedented scale, disseminate that information. And unfortunately, that has harmful consequences. We've talked in here at length about the way that Mr. Snowden's unauthorized disclosures <coughs> put, uh, put Americans in harm's way, uh, whether that's compromising the identity of uh, undercover intelligence operatives or uh, unauthorized disclosure of information that has an impact on the safety and security of our men and women in uniform. So that's the, that's the modern environment in which we're operating in, and that's why the administration has undertaken so many of the, reforms effort, so many of the reform efforts that I described to Michelle uh, to try to counter this insider threat. Um, and as we uh, learn more about ways that bad actors evade uh, those reforms, you know, we'll learn those lessons. We'll beef up our defenses even further. Uh, but it continues to be the belief, not just of this administration, but of national security professionals in both parties, that the greater risk is associated with withholding that information and not effectively sharing it. And this was one of the lessons that we learned in the aftermath of 9-11, that the, you know, the sto internal stovepiping in the federal government um, detracted from our national security. And there has been a concerted effort to more effectively share that information um, to protect the American people. That has been a good thing. That has been a, that has revolutionized the way that intelligence information is used to protect our interests and to protect our country. Uh, but uh, it has also um, um, caused us to confront uh, this, this uh, most latest, uh, most recent risk. Josh, you talked about <clears throat> waiting until the investigation is done to to undertake further reforms, but given that this guy seemed to defy so many of the reforms that were implemented post Snowden in 2014, the two-person rule, the no thumb dive rule, isn't there a, just an extraordinary urgency that this administration needs to have right now about reminding the entire federal government in sort of a hair on fire way that these rules are in place and cannot be defied. Yeah. There, there, let me assure you that there is a sense of urgency around this. And um, I did not mean to leave you with the impression that we're not going to do anything until the investigation is completed. If over the course of the investigation we learn information that could be valuable in patching vulnerabilities, um, we will undertake that work immediately. What I think is also true is that the vast majority of the men and women in our intelligence community our, our people, our experts, our professionals who take these rules very seriously. They're patriotic Americans who dedicate their lives to protecting this country. And they have a valuable expertise that they use to protect this country. So the vast majority of them don't need to be reminded of just how serious this is. Uh, but uh, you know, I, I think everybody who serves in the intelligence community recognizes uh, the grave consequences for not uh, following the rules that are on the books. Uh, and again, I say that without knowing exactly uh, or, or at least without being able to discuss in detail what we know about this particular situation. But, um, you know, it's hard to, uh, let me clarify, the point is this. It's not clear in this situation uh, whether th uh, these alleged crimes were committed because the rules weren't being effectively followed or if there was a creative way for getting around the rules. But either way, if there are reforms that we can implement to either ensure greater fidelity to these policies or further strengthening of these policies, we'll do that 
to ensure the safety and security of the sensitive information. Are you confident right now that you have this, the boundaries of this leak um, understood and under control? In other words, that you are fairly secure that you know who leaked the NSA intercept details and the recent NSA computer codes and that you've got all of that stopped? Or do you have confidence that, that this is now under control, the leaks are plugged, and you've got everyone that you need to, to get in this investigation? Uh, Gardner, I think it's an entirely legitimate question, but it's one that's going to have to be directed to my colleagues at the Department of Justice. They're the ones that are conducting the investigation, and so uh, I'll let them speak to the scope of it. Do you know what contractor this guy worked for prior to Booz? Because I think part of this took place prior to his Booz um, yeah. Is that also details? That yeah, I, I, I can't speak to this individual's employment history, uh, but um, Sorry, that, that may be a detail that the Department of Justice can share with you. Okay. Okay. Sarah. Thanks, Josh. Uh, so today a poll came out uh, from CNN showing the president's approval rating at 55 percent, which is the highest of his uh, second term. Thank you for mentioning yeah. it. Sure. <laughs> Thought you might appreciate that. Um, <laughs> it's a little awkward for me to do that from up here, so. <laughs> yeah. I take some pride in it nonetheless. <laughs> And uh, that it's been trending upward um, since uh, earlier this year. And, and just from a macro perspective, it seems perhaps a little counterintuitive given that the, the other trend that we've seen in this election is this thirst for change. And so I'm just wondering if the president has, has any insight into, you know, what's, what's at play there. Yeah. Well, listen, I, I the, I'll, I'll let you guys, uh, you know, do the important work of analyzing the polls. And Lord knows there are plenty of people who are volunteering for that responsibility. Um, what I will say is that the president is enormously proud of the progress that we've made uh, in this country over the last eight years. When President Obama took office, he obviously encountered uh, the worst economic downturn since the Great Depression. Uh, and the progress that we've made over the last seven and a half, almost eight years is remarkable and um, I think was better than anybody had predicted seven and a half years ago. The kind of sustained job creation that we've seen in this country, the longest consecutive monthly streak in our history, uh, the progress that we've made in putting upward pressure on wages, uh, the success that we've had in reducing poverty. Um, poverty uh, fell uh, more in 2015 than it has in any year since the 1960s. Uh, and the increase in median wages in this country was, in 2015, was the greatest uh, or the largest on record. So uh, that's an indication that we really have made critically important progress. And uh, the president has always, the president's approach has always been to focus on longer term goals. And there are situations in which that longer term focus has had an impact on the numbers reflected in short term polls. But the president has been willing to sacrifice uh, the hot takes for longer term results. And you know, after eight years in this office, I think that is a strategy that uh, has strongly benefited the American people. And um, it's starting to show up in the polls. And the president does take uh, uh, some satisfaction with that. In terms of sort of reconciling the, uh, I think, the unquestioned desire for some changes in our government. I think you won't be surprised to hear me say that I would attribute that to the dysfunction that has run rampant under Republican leadership in Congress. And that has contributed to deep frustration, not just inside the White House, but in houses all across the country, that Congress has failed time and time again to do common sense things would be good for the country because Republicans continually prioritize politics. And whether that is you know, the, kind of, the kind of common sense investments in infrastructure and education that would have a positive economic impact, or the kind of common sense reforms of our immigration system, you know, there are a variety of ways to measure the congressional dysfunction in a way that's left people quite dissatisfied with the way they're being represented in Washington, D.C. right now. Um, so. You know, I, I recognize there may be some uh, Republicans with a different analysis, but um, you got to admit that the analysis that I've just offered is uh, is backed up by the numbers. But, but uh, 
both presidential candidates also have kind of historically high negative ratings uh, in addition to, to Congress and, and the media. Um, uh, but so is the president's popularity actually just organically people liking Barack Obama, or is it sort of in comparison people, people are expressing a preference? Well, I think it's probably a little bit of both. I think that people are pleased with the president's performance in office, and that's reflected in the uh, uh, in the polls you saw today. I think the president has always maintained um, a personal uh, approval rating, uh, even among those who don't support his policies, because uh, they see the uh, approach that he's taken to his job, even if that hasn't led to the kind of uh, policy outcomes that they would like to see. But they see the president as somebody uh, who actually can be a role model to our kids. Uh, they see somebody who is a, uh, a good husband and a good father. They see somebody who is serious about his faith. They see somebody who takes his job very seriously, but himself uh, not more seriously than necessary. And um, so I, I think the, the, the public appraisal of the president's character is one that even in the most difficult times has uh, been pretty durable. Um, and I think people are reminded of that when they hear some of the re rhetoric that's uttered uh, by um, the Republican nominee for president. Uh, and. I think that might lead some uh, Republicans and independents to conclude that uh, for as frustrated as they are with Washington right now, they've been pleased with the decisions that the guy sitting in the Oval Office has been making. Okay, Margaret. Josh, given the new relationship with Cuba and Dr. Biden traveling there, was there any, can we anticipate any kind of offer to help them with hurricane recovery? Uh, I'm not aware of any changes uh, for Dr. Biden's schedule, but um, you know, given the impact that the storm has, has had in that region of the world, uh, I would anticipate that this will uh, be a, a, an added feature of her trip, uh, that she'll be talking about um, work that the United States can do to uh, uh, help those who are recovering from the storm. And there, under the status of the relationship now, any kind of aid to help with that relief is permitted? or? Uh, I'm not sure of the kinds of rules that would govern uh, that kind of assistance, but we can certainly look into that for you. Um, question for you. Uh, when you were talking about Syria and you mentioned the support for diplomacy, <coughs> including that of the UN, were you specifically um, supporting about the, the proposal from the UN envoy de Mistura to go into Aleppo himself to help escort out those who were fleeing that city? Yeah. Well, I, I was not referring to any specific statement uh, or initiative from uh, Mr. De Mistura. Rather, uh, our general support for the tireless efforts that he has led to focus international attention on uh, this troubling situation and to try to find a solution. Uh, he's done important work, and you know, he's preserved the kind of um, he's played an important role in trying to bring the international community together uh, around some constructive ideas for addressing some potential solutions. We haven't found it yet with regard to the situation in Aleppo, but uh, that has not prevented him from working tirelessly uh, and in good faith to try to find that kind of solution. Wouldn't you say that's kind of an extraordinary offer in terms of the sense of urgency being felt there right now, that the diplomacy otherwise has not led to anything that would provide immediate relief? So Leon would offer to go in himself? Yeah, it is, a, it is an extraordinary offer. I, you know, I, Again, I, it's hard to know whether or not that's a uh, you know, a rhetorical device that he was using to express his own personal sense of urgency, or um, you know, or if he was packing his luggage. I don't. Uh, you'd have to ask him what his intent was. But I think that, uh, regardless of what specifically his message was, I think he's conveying a sense of urgency that um, many people, including the president of the United States, feel. Um, and can I just ask you? You said the other day from the podium that there was nothing left to be discussed with the Russians, and that's why the U.S. was severing these, suspending these talks. But John Kerry's back talking to Sergei Lavrov now. What made the president decide to say, start talking to Russia again about Syria? Well, I'll let uh, my colleagues at the State Department uh, read out the nature of those conversations. I mean, what we have said all along is that there are a variety of aspects to, uh, to the relationship between the United States and Russia. And but you know, they, they talk a about big a lot part of it. What Syria and the readout they gave. So again, I'll, I'll let them talk about the details of what was uh, what was discussed. 
that what I can tell you that they were not talking about uh, is trying to, um, you know, reinstitute the kind of cessation of hostilities agreement that uh, we thought we'd instituted a, a month or so ago, uh, but failed because of Russia's repeated and violent abrogation of the commitments that they had made in the context of those talks. So just to be clear, when you, when you were talking about suspending, you were specifically only talking about that U.S. offer of potential military coordination with Russia. That's off the table. That's not being revisited. But we can still talk about Russia, about other diplomatic initiatives in Syria. Well, Is that what you're saying? Well, obviously, Russia is going to have to be a part of any sort of U.N. process because they sit on the Security Council. Russia is a member of the International uh, Syria Support Group. Uh, that is another multilateral institution that we have or another multilateral uh, uh, venue where the United States has tried to find a solution. Russia has been a part of those as well. Um, you know, we've never indicated that we were shutting off all diplomatic ties with Russia, uh, but we did make clear that Russia had too often and repeatedly violated the kinds of commitments that they had made that made it unnecessary or unworkable uh, to continue to uh, pursue that specific approach. Uh, but um, there are a variety of other ways in which Russia is involved, and uh, they will continue to be. Uh, but the, the kind of arrangement that we had envisioned of getting Russia to play a constructive role in reducing violence in exchange for um, closer Russian-U.S. military cooperation going after extremists is uh, an agreement that uh, never materialized, unfortunately. And when you said um, the U.S. has no interest in escalating the violence in Syria, were you <coughs> specifically in response to the question about uh, Russia's sort of bellicose statements lately, were, were you basically saying you've got nothing to worry about, I mean, that the U.S. won't be using any kind of military force in any form or fashion? Well, what I'm saying is that the uh, I'm, I'm not going to be in a position where I'm taking options off the table for the commander-in-chief. Uh, I think I've discussed in some detail, I think the President's discussed in some detail, uh, why um, military action against the Assad regime uh, to try to address the situation in, in Aleppo uh, is unlikely to accomplish the goals that many envision now in terms of reducing the violence there, uh, and is much more likely to lead to a bunch of unintended consequences that are clearly not in our national interest. Um, but. Uh, I'm not going to take any options off the table, and um, I think what I'm articulating is uh, a, a desire to de-escalate the situation inside of Syria, to de-escalate the conflict, to reduce the violence, and uh, try to bring some much-needed humanitarian assistance um, to those who need it so uh, who need it the most. Okay, John. Thank you, Josh. We have questions first, uh, and I hope I'm saying the name right. Dr. Zahir Sahul of the American Relief Committee for Syria, uh, when he appeared on the France 24 debate on Tuesday night, said that what is happening in Syria was reminiscent of Sarajevo and Srebrenica, and he called it ethnic cleansing. Uh, is that the administration's official opinion? of what is happening in Syria, ethnic cleansing as well? Uh, I've not uh, seen that label be used uh, in this particular situation. Um, obviously, we have been deeply concerned about the widespread violence that's been perpetrated against innocent civilians. Uh, in some cases, that, uh, that violence uh, has been motivated by religious differences, um, and that's deeply troubling. Uh, you've heard the uh, State Department uh, talk about the how the increased violence in the region uh, has fueled extremism uh, and uh, has created a, a situation where there are populations that are uh, at risk of genocide. So the situation inside of Syria is a deeply troubling one, uh, both because of the actions, both as a direct consequence of the actions of the Assad regime but also the second and, order, second and third order consequences of uh, their actions that have only contributed to a sense of chaos there that's fueled extremism, uh, that has uh, 
worsened uh, the kind of sectarian conflict there uh, that um, has cost too many innocent lives already. And we're, we're, we're deeply concerned about um, the potential of further of a further escalation in violence. Now the question is, does the administration agree with former President Clinton that the Affordable Health Care Act needs tinkering and fixing? Uh, John, I, the very day that the President uh, signed the Affordable Care Act into law, he indicated a commitment, uh, uh, a willingness uh, to work with Democrats or Republicans on Capitol Hill who had good ideas for further strengthening the law. The Affordable Care Act has provided enormous benefits. 20 million Americans have health insurance that didn't have it before the Affordable Care Act went into effect. Min millions more Americans benefit from the consumer protections associated with not being discriminated against because they have a pre-existing condition, not being charged more because you're a woman, not being uh, dragged into bankruptcy court because somebody in your family gets sick, not getting kicked off your health insurance because you get sick. Uh, these are all consumer protections that are available to uh, uh, tens of millions of Americans. These are consumer protections that weren't available before. So uh, the Affordable Care Act has had an enormously positive impact on the country. Uh, but if there are other things that we can do to further strengthen the Affordable Care Act, the President's talked about the idea of adding a public option uh, that could make uh, state-based marketplaces even more competitive. Uh, and give consumers even more options. Uh, that obviously would be one way we could strengthen the law. Um, but you know, ultimately, uh, it requires congressional action, and we'll have to see if uh, Congress's Republicans in Congress are willing to consider anything other than just repealing the law, which would repeal all those consumer protections that I just talked about. Uh, so the president strongly opposes the idea of repealing the law, uh, but he's willing to work with Republicans if they're. I'm prepared to work with him to strengthen it. So he agrees with President Clinton uh, on that, that it needs some fixing and he's willing to do it. Uh, considering that President Obama said it uh, six years ago, I think it'd be fair to say that President Clinton uh, agrees with President Obama uh, about that. Thanks. Okay. All right. Pam, I'll give you the last one. Okay. Um, the Trump campaign put out a statement calling the Paris Climate Accord just another bad deal, saying it will cost the American economy <coughs> trillions of dollars, impose uh, higher electricity costs for Americans and gives China an edge because it allows China to keep raising their emissions for a dozen years. Do you want to respond to that? Well, the benefits associated with the uh, uh, international agreement, the historic agreement to cut carbon pollution, uh, are significant for the United States, both in terms of the impact they'll have on the environment, but also in terms of the impact uh, it will have on our economy. China, for the first time, because of tough principled diplomacy on the part of the United States, agreed for the first time to limit their, emis to limit their emissions. You'll recall that Republicans' chief criticism of any <coughs> effort to undertake a reduction in carbon pollution by the United States was that China would never go along with it. They were wrong about that. We just needed somebody who was tough enough to go and negotiate a smart deal with the Chinese, which is exactly what the Obama administration did. Uh, and as a result, that catalyzed the international community to also make commitments that, again, will have po a positive impact on uh, reducing uh, carbon pollution and have a positive impact on the health of the planet. What this will also do uh, is send a very clear, unmistakable market signal to entrepreneurs in the clean energy sector. 196 countries have now made a commitment to reduce their carbon pollution. That means they are on the market for figuring out how to produce energy and reduce their carbon pollution. That is a wide open market for people who have an innovative approach to uh, solar energy or wind energy, uh, hydroelectric energy. Ed, that is uh, an open market to people that have, uh, are ready to take to market new battery technology or other forms of improved energy efficiency. Uh, that's, not, uh, that's no longer a niche market. That is now a global market. And the President is determined to make sure that the United States is at the cutting edge of that market. Uh, and uh, that's why the U.S. government, in the context of the Recovery Act, supported so many loans to the clean energy sector. Uh, and it's why the United States is now poised to benefit from 
uh, the kind of commitments that countries are making all around uh, the countries all around the world are making, and uh, that's a good thing. And that's why this agreement is one that isn't just good for our uh, our planet. It's going to end up being a really good thing for the U.S. economy. Uh, and one more, um, NOAA says that there have been 12 weather events so far this year that cost a billion dollars. Uh, any concern about the impact on the economy of these kinds of weather events or the government's ability to continue funding disaster uh, assistance? And there have been a string of small earthquakes in California raising concern about a big one coming. Have there been any special preparations for that? Uh, I'm not aware of any uh, uh, earthquake preparations that are, uh, that are underway. Um, I think I'd refer you to officials in, uh, uh, at the U.S. Geological Service uh, or uh, in California about that. Uh, as it relates to the potential economic impact of the storm, that's something that we're always mindful of. Uh, and the, the, some of the cities uh, and the potential uh, path of the storm uh, have large populations. Uh, and displacing large populations can have a, um, a negative impact on the economy. So we'll certainly uh, watch that. But we're also prepared to mobilize significant financial resources to help those, uh, econ uh, to help those communities uh, recover as quickly as possible and get life back to normal as quickly as possible. Uh, so we've done a lot of preparation in advance of that, and um, um, you know, we intend to work closely with state and local officials to make that happen. Okay. Thanks, everybody. Have a good rest of the day.